IT Essential 7.0 um, starts out with the introduction to personal computer hardware. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of the important information within that chapter. Um, to start with the objectives in this chapter, um, we're going to deal with personal computers, explaining how to keep personal computer components safe, um, as well as what are the components in the computer, and then talk a little bit about the electrical and ESD safety. Next, we're going to talk about the PC components. We need to look at the features and functions, cases and power supplies, motherboards, talk about CPUs, the different types of memory, and then we have what we call our adapter cards, which fit into our expansion slots on the PC, and then describe the hard disk drives, and then also solid state drives within that computer. Um, also, looking at optical storage devices for those PCs that still have them, talk about the ports, cables, and the different adapters that are available, and then finally talk about the input and output devices. And then we will end the chapter with doing the disassembly of the PC, which we will work with in our lab. So first, let's go ahead and talk about safety. Um, when we're talking about safety, we want to make sure that our workplace is safe. We want to be able to prevent people from injury because injury prevention is everyone's responsibility. So when you're working in lab, you need to pay attention to what's going on kind of around you and um, make sure that everybody is utilizing safe work practices. Um, by doing so, you can prevent injuries. Um, always make sure that we're following national industry and workplace safety rules. When you go to work in the lab, you know, you really need to be alert and awake. You are working with electricity, you're working with tools, um, and, you know, they will tell you that a tired worker is a dangerous worker, not only to yourself, but to other people. Make sure that you get the proper training before you work with anything. You know, when we're working with electricity, power tools, you need to be trained to use those things. Don't just assume that you know how to use them. And then make sure that you use safety equipment. Um, in our particular industry, usually you're not going to have anything that you have to lift that's more than 50 pounds, but you should always remember that you need to lift things with your legs and not your back. There are a lot of back injuries every year in the workplace because we bend over to lift something up and we don't lift properly. Um, again, whenever you're working with anything, make sure that um, you know, you're not utilizing drugs and alcohol when you're at work. Um, always be professional. You know, clowning around, practical jokes are fun when you're not working with the equipment, but you want to make sure that nobody is harmed. And just make sure that you stay current with things. Um, again, you know, using equipment um, to protect from damage and protecting your environment from contamination. Those are all important things to keep in mind. Characteristics of a safe workplace, clean, organized, and properly lit. Um, our labs should be all of those things at all times. Proper procedures for handling equipment. Make sure that you're carrying or handling your screwdrivers correctly. Make sure that you unplug power from the wall correctly. Don't just jerk the cord out of the wall. Um, and then make sure that you're properly disposing or recycling components and equipment. Um, you can go out and Google South Dakota's DENR, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, and it will tell you if you Google like computer components, where you can take those components to properly dispose of them. Um, even ink and toner cartridges need to be properly disposed of. You're not just supposed to throw those things in the garbage. Even the same with like a, a regular battery, like a C battery and a double A battery, etc. Um, in terms of safety guidelines, most companies require you to report any injuries, including a description of the safety procedure that was not followed. In our case, we want to make sure that we document any injuries that occur. So I don't care. It's like I tell my students um, when I'm doing lifeguard training. I don't care if you gave somebody a Band-Aid. I want to know about it so that it can be documented and that, you know, we can follow up on that later if we need to. Damage to equipment can result in claims for damages to the customer. The one thing that you guys need to be sure of is like when we're working in lab, you know, be careful. But if something gets damaged, this is a learning environment. And so we can go back and replace the equipment 
Um, you know, and that's how we learn. We make mistakes and usually we don't make those mistakes again. When we're talking about types of safety guidelines, we have general, we have electrical, and we have fire. Um, again, safe working conditions are going to help prevent accidents and injuries, and if you're properly handling the components, um, it will help prevent loss um, from damaged equipment. And then if you're disposing of things properly, you're helping to take care of your environment. And so a professional technician will follow the proper safety guidelines. Um, and honestly, customers prefer to deal with people who are responsible. So that's why we want to keep our workplace safe. When we started class, we talked about the lab safety agreement. Everybody signed the lab safety agreement just indicating what it was that we were going to do when we were working in lab. Just some basic general precautions when you're working with a PC. You should always remove watches, jewelry, you know, anything that you have because they can conduct electricity. And so, um, you know, you should really be taking out earrings, removing necklaces, bracelets, anything that could jingle loose. Um, the same with um, making sure that you don't have like flowy clothing that can get sucked up into the fan. Um, again, you know, things that you probably wouldn't normally think of, but things that can really lend to safety. Be sure that you always turn off the power and unplug the cord from the back of the PC before you begin any type of service. Um, remember that um, capacitors inside of a PC can maintain a charge even with it being unplugged, but you always need to unplug that cable, that power cable from the back of the PC. Cover sharp edges inside the um, computer case with equipment, or I'm sorry, cover the sharp edges of the computer case with tape because those components within that computer um, could cause you, you know, cuts and those kinds of things. So if you're going to be working with some really sharp edges, you should just cover those with tape and, and masking tape or a painter's tape is fine. Never ever open a power supply or a CRT monitor. We mentioned in class when we were talking about tools that when you're working with an anti-static wrist strap, you never ground yourself to those two items. The reason we're not going to open power supplies and CRT monitors is because this course does not train us to work on those things. Now, those students who might possibly be in the SCADA program, you may learn how to build your own power supply and work with those, but just know that that is outside the scope of what this class teaches. Do not touch areas in printers that are hot and that use high voltage. When you're working with a laser printer, you really have to be careful because the corona wire maintains a charge that could hurt you severely um, if you get electrocuted. Know where the fire extinguisher is located and how to use it. We talked about the fact that it is located right outside of our classroom doors in the middle of the hallway. Keep food and drinks out of your workspace. Again, you don't want to be spilling a drink on someone's computer component and then have it short out because of that. Um, and you don't need to be eating around components. When you're working in a professional situation, those things will not be permitted. Keeping your workspace free of and clean of clutter will also help. Um, you know, get things off of your desk and out of your workspace that you don't need. Um, it will just help to maintain your flow of work. And again, like I said, bend your knees when you're lifting heavy objects so that you avoid injury to your back. General safety guidelines, just follow the basic safety guidelines to help prevent injuries, cuts, burns, electrical shock, damage to your eyesight, and falls. Know the location of your safety equipment. The fire extinguisher, the first aid kits are located um, in the classrooms. Um, there are AEDs that are outside of the classrooms, again, in the middle of the hallway. And then... You know, poorly placed or unsecured cables can cause tripping hazards in a network installation. Cables should be installed in a conduit or placed in cable trays. Um, if you have to plug something in on a floor or you're trying to cable two PCs um, between an aisle or a row of desks, that is going to cause a tripping and or safety hazard. So um, also if 
we were ever to be inspected by OSHA and we were doing those things. Those are a violation of OSHA standards for the safe workplace. Electrical safety guidelines, um, these will just allow us to um, prevent electrical fires, injuries, fatalities um, in the home and in the workplace. Again, power supplies and monitors contain very high voltage and only experienced technicians, which were not trained in those two areas, they should attempt to repair power supplies and monitors while most users would simply just replace them. Fire safety guidelines. Um, you want to be able to protect yourselves, just the equipment that you work with, the structures, and so you want to avoid electrical shock because you don't want to provide or prevent, you want to be able to prevent damage to the PC. Um, so again, like I said, turn it off, unplug it before you begin a repair, and then have a plan in place um, in case there's a fire. Um, in either one of the labs that we work in, we will exit through um, entrance TC5 of our building, which is the east wing of the building, and then we will proceed um, to the right when we exit the building and go south up into the big main parking lot. Um, so you want to have, you know, where your fire extinguisher are fire extinguishers are and you know how to use them. Um, we know how to get out of the building. We all have cell phones with us. We can contact 911 if we need to. Um, make sure that you're keeping your workplace or your workspace clean and then keep solvents in a separate area because anything that might possibly be combustible you don't want around electrical sources. When you use a fire extinguisher, if you are unsure of how to use it, you can follow the simple mnemonic device or they call it a memory aid of pass, which will help you remember what to do. So P, you pull the pin. A, you aim at the base of the fire, not the flames, because you need to put out the fire where it originated from and shooting at the flames will not do that. You need to squeeze the lever and then you need to sweep that nozzle from side to side to be able to properly use a fire extinguisher. Procedures to protect the environment. Um, computers and peripherals contain materials that can be harmful to the environment. You need to protect that environment by responsibly disposing of and recycling. In um, our labs, in your place of work, you should see what are called material safety data sheets or MSDS sheets. These are fact sheets that summarize information about the material, the identification, including hazardous ingredients that can affect personal health, um, what those fire hazards might be, and then first aid requirements in case you're exposed to those. Um, so for instance, if you were working with canned air, you want to find, you go out and Google the specific brand of canned air, and um, it will tell you what to do in case you know, somebody has aimed it at their hand and they've gotten frostbite on their hand because it gets very, very cold. Or if you're working with isopropyl alcohol and someone accidentally ingested it or they accidentally got it in their eye, what you would need to do for first aid for that. So in your place of work, anything that is considered to be potentially dangerous or hazardous, you should have an MSDS sheet for that. Um, also, the MSDS sheets will tell you how to properly um, dispose of materials. You just have to make sure that you contact your local recycling facilities um, or waste removal facilities to be able to take care of that. Um, I believe in Mitchell, if I'm still correct, uh, Goodwill and Mitchell will take used computer components because what they will do is they will recycle PCs. Um, I'm not sure in Mitchell any longer who will recycle toner cartridges um, for printers. We used to have what was called um, Best Business Products, and they are no longer in business. Um, but again, if you go out to the, the South Dakota's DENR website and Google that, um, it will tell you the places in South Dakota that take care of that. Just on a side note, a lot of businesses um, that supply computer components. So for instance, like Best Buy out of Sioux Falls, um, they're required to take in at least one third of what they put out. So for all of the computers that they sell, 
they are supposed to take a third of them back in for recycling purposes just to help protect the environment. And so, you, you know, I encourage you, you can do some research on some companies and see what their requirements are. Um, just a little bit of information again on those MSDS sheets. It's going to tell you the name of the material, the physical properties and makeup of that material, what the hazardous ingredients may be, um, what the reactivity data is, you know, like what happens if it's exposed to fire or if there's an explosion, um, procedures for spill or leaks, any special precautions, health hazards, or protective equipment or protective requirements. You know, maybe you need to wear a mask when you're working with a particular solvent, or maybe you need to wear gloves when you're working with a particular um, material. So just some things to keep in mind. Um, MSDS, Material Safety Data Sheet. Um, you know, when we talk about equipment disposal, batteries from PCs can contain lead, cadmium, lithium, alkaline manganese and mercury and all of those things um, you don't want to be putting into the environment you don't want to be burying them into the ground monitors can contain up to four pounds of lead as well as other rare earth metals so again that's why they need to be properly disposed of um, as well as your printer and toner cartridges proper tool use Safety begins in the workplace and it's everybody's responsibility. So before you begin um, working with equipment, whether you're cleaning or repairing, make sure that the equipment is in good condition. Um, proper use of anti-static wrist straps can help prevent ESD damage. Remember we said 30 volts can destroy um, a device. And so if you look here, you can see your anti-static wrist strap whoops sorry um, it's number nine on your diagram I don't know for sure if the mouse pointer shows up with this or not um, also you know components are in anti-static bags so this number five shows you what an anti-static bag looks like remember we said never wear an anti-static wrist strap if you're if you're repairing a monitor or a power supply um, you might also use the anti-static mats along with the wrist straps that we talked about. You know, another thing is too that you can ground yourself to the work tables in the lab just by simply like touching your leg to the table because your foot is on the ground so you could ground yourself that way. Um, proper use of hand tools. These other images show you hand tools so you've got um, a nut driver in number one, number two appears to be the flathead, number three would be your tweezers, number four is a voltmeter if you've got to check uh, voltage on a power supply. Again, five is those anti-static bags that you will find hard drives and memory will come in those. Um, number six is the Torx, it's the star-headed tip screwdriver. Um, number seven is the extractor because it's got the secures and bows. Um, number eight would be one of the cleaning materials. So that's just a monitor cleaning wipe that you can use. Um, and then number nine again is that anti-static wrist strap. And number 10 is the chip inserter for your CPU. Um, again, before you clean any device, make sure that you unplug it and that it is um, turned off so that you are making sure that you are um, handling those things correctly. When you work with the anti-static wrist strap, um, you're supposed to attach the wire on the same side of the equipment as the arm wearing the strap. And I'm not sure if I mentioned that during our demonstration. That'll just keep the wire out of your way while you're working. Um, so something to keep in mind. Um, you can also prevent the risk in, in addition to wearing that wrist strap if you Avoid wearing clothing that's made of silk, polyester, or wool because they're more likely to generate a static charge. Um, make sure that your shirts are tucked in, your sleeves are rolled up, you don't have scarves or ties on. We already talked about the jewelry. Um, the wrist strap isn't going to protect you against really high voltages. Um, so again, that's why you're not going to wear it when you are using a monitor or a wrist strap. 
Um, if you're going to use the mat, again, you can clip that um, to the case on the mat. Um, make sure that you always handle components by the edges um, so that you don't get any of your bodily oils or fluids on any of the cards. Um, and then make sure that when you're working with your tools, um, if excessive force is needed, there's probably something wrong. If you have to use excessive force, like if you're trying to unscrew something, you might try to use that orange handled screwdriver. Um, and if that doesn't work, then we need to look at why it's jammed in there per se. Um, make sure that, um, you don't have magnetized tools because obviously magnetized tools and electronic devices don't play dice. You should never use a pencil inside of a PC because if it's actual lead, it can act as a conductor of electricity. Um, and then just make sure that, you know, when you clean components, anything on a PC can be cleaned by using just a damp cloth. Water and a damp cloth are a mild detergent. Um, you don't have to have anything fancy to be able to clean. You should always use isopropyl alcohol. And they talk about 90% isopropyl alcohol or greater. And um, since COVID, I have not been able to find alcohol that's 91% or higher. Um, anything that's less than 90% is considered to be rubbing alcohol and it can have contaminants in it. It's not as pure. And so that's why they say that you should only use, you know, isopropyl alcohol that's at least 90% or more alcohol. Um, so we'll talk about more about um, complete cleaning components and computers as we go through class. The personal computer, um, electrical safety is important. Electrical devices have certain power requirements. Um, AC adapters are manufactured for specific laptops. So that means that you can't just take my charger and use it on your laptop because um, the specifications may be different and it could harm your PC, even if the ports look like they're the same. Um, some printer parts, such as power supplies, contain high voltage. So check the printer manual for the location of the high voltage components, and you'll see it located or identified with the um, triangular lightning bolt symbol. Make sure you follow electrical safety guidelines to prevent electrical fires, injuries, and fatalities. ESD, or electrostatic discharge, occurs when there's buildup of an electric charge that exists on a surface which comes into contact with another charged surface. Um, static electricity can build up as you walk across a carpeted floor. When you touch another person, you both receive the shock. Um, something to keep in mind, again, ESD can damage equipment. It only takes 30 volts. At least 3,000 volts of static electricity has to build up before a person can actually feel the ESD. It takes at least 6,000 volts of static electricity to hear the ESD. So when you hear that pop, you know, that it makes, it's at least 6,000 volts. And it's at least 8,000 volts to see ESD. So when you actually see a spark, that means there's been at least 8,000 volts of ESD. So we want to make sure that we prevent ESD from happening. Whoops, sorry. Um, in order to do that, we need to keep all components in anti-static bags until you're ready to install them. Setting a component on top of an anti-static bag is not keeping it inside. So I see a lot of people take motherboards out of the bag and set it on side. The protection is inside the bag, not sitting on top of the bag. Use grounded mats and workbenches, um, grounded floor mats. They also make floor mats that you can stand on to help prevent ESD, um, as well as wearing those anti-static wrist straps. It's very important for you to remember that climate affects computer equipment in a variety of ways. If the environment temperature is too high, equipment can overheat. If the humidity level is too low, then the chance of ESD increases 
because you don't have that moisture in the air. And if the humidity level is too high, then obviously you can damage components because of excess moisture. PC components. First, we're going to start talking about the cases. Um, the cases house the internal components of the computer, so things like your power supply, motherboard, your CPU, um, your memory, your disk drives, and a variety of adapter cards. You need um, They provide protection. They should be durable. They should have room for expansion and provide for good airflow. Um, the term form factor refers to the physical design and the look of the case. Some common desktop computers um, have a variety of form factors. You may see a horizontal case. And so the horizontal case, um, the monitor is placed on top of the case, typically used for like home theater type systems. Then you have that full tower case or that full size case. Vertically, um, it stands typically on the floor, has room for expansion. Um, you know, one of the big things when you set something on the floor is it's more prone to get dirt and dust into it. So we like to really see them up maybe on the desktop level, but um, understandably most times we see them on the floor. Compact towers are just a smaller version of the full-size vertical tower. Um, a lot of times you see them in businesses. And they also have room for expansion with adapter cards, just like the full-size tower. Um, and then you have the all-in-one computer system. Um, the components are all integrated and there's little or no room for expansion. And typically the power supply is external to the PC, so it's not actually part of the case. So I just wanted to quickly show you um, some cases when we're talking about the ports on the backs of the cases. Um, this diagram over here to the right that's labeled ports shows you all of the different types of ports that you might see on PCs. The important thing to be able to do is to transfer your knowledge from one case to the next. So this middle diagram is actually showing you the motherboard or the onboard ports. So all of these ports are on the board itself. Um, PS2 keyboard connectors and PS2 mouse. You know, keyboards are purple, um, the mouse is green. With a PS2 port, if a mouse becomes a little bit disconnected or it jiggles out of that port, you have to restart the PC in order for it to gain connectivity again. Um, that's why most PCs, if we look over here at the left at this black one, have gone to USB ports because USB ports are hot swappable, hot pluggable, you can just plug it in and it works. So if one mouse stops working, you can unplug it and plug another one in and it works. You don't have to restart your PC. Um, chances are you're probably not going to see serial ports. You know, this form factor of this board, you probably won't see much anymore. Serial ports means that it transfers data one bit at a time. Parallel ports, um, it can transfer um, bits of data bi-directionally. Um, they used to be used for old printers. Um, the VGA port used to be the old video port. It's um, really an analog port, not used much anymore at all. Um, you have your old game ports. You have your audio ports, um, your audio out, your line in, which would be um, like your... Um, your audio jack, you have your microphone. This one just shows a couple of two USB 2.0 ports and then you've got your NIC port or your Ethernet LAN port or some people call them an RJ45 port. Um, they have lots of different names. If we look at this case, this black case on the left, this is the one that you'll probably see most often. Um, you see you're going to have a variety of USB ports. Um, you have a network port um, it looks like you have an HDMI port over here, um, and then you also have all of your variety of sound ports. Usually they have a little stamp next to the item so that you know what it is, like this little pink one has the microphone next to it, and then um, the green one would be your line out or your audio jack, so that's where your headphones would go, and then this little light blue one would be like your line in or your audio, for your audio jack, you know, some people call it stereo. So these ports in this area, in this black area, are on board. Um, but then you look at this right below, this would be an adapter card. 
a video adapter card because you can see that it has the DVI video port on it and it also has um, the HDMI video port on it. So I would just encourage you as you're looking at this and you're looking at some of the different ports, you need to be able to kind of like memorize what the ports look like, not be so worried about color, but maybe what their appearance is, um, because you have to be able to transfer that knowledge from one device to another. So for instance, on this middle one, none of these are indicated with a color to tell you what they are. Um, when you look at these, you can definitely see what they are based on color. So I just wanted to share a little bit about ports with you. Um, power supplies. Computers use the power supplies, obviously, to convert that AC power into the lower voltage DC power, which you need for computer components to be able to function. And so we have different form factors, we call them. So we have the AT form factor. This was the original power supply for old legacy computers. Um, I do still have a motherboard and could show you what an AT form factor looks like. Um, ATX is the updated version of the AT. It just stands for AT Extended. Um, the ATX 12 volt is the most common power supply on the market today. And then we also have the EPS 12 volt, which was originally designed for network servers, but is now used commonly for those high-end desktop models. PC components, um, we have connectors. So the power supply includes several different connectors. Um, they're used to power the different internal components um, such as the motherboard and the disk drives. So we have some examples. We have the 20 or the 24 pin slotted connector. Um, when you kind of look at the ends of those connectors, you can see that some are rounded, some are square, and it's keyed. It's got this little, um, you can see, like it's got this little black key point on here. Um, it's keyed, so you push that in um, to be able to connect it. Um, and then be able to release it. So it's only going to go in there one way. Then you have the SATA keyed connector. Um, this connector is actually the SATA um, power connector. Um, it's got 15 pins. If you were to count every one of those little pins in there, you would come up with a 15 pin power connector. You have the Molex, which is the old power um, for like um, hard drives and optical drives. It's four pins. Again, it's keyed. It can only go in one way when you look at how that goes. All of these are keyed. Um, this old Berg connector actually was for a floppy drive. Um, it looks similar to fan power, but it is not fan power. And just to share with you, I did have somebody <laughs> plug the Berg connector for the floppy drive into the um, fan power and it started the cable on fire it actually melted the the cabling right off of the wire <laughs> so you need to be a little ca cautious with things like that um, you have the four to eight pin auxiliary power um, usually that auxiliary power is going to power your monitor so if you plug in the 20 to 24 pin power but don't plug in the auxiliary power your monitor won't come on then you also have the six to eight pin pcie power connector um, power supply voltage. Um, the different connectors in a power supply also provide different voltages. The most common voltages are 3.3, 5, and 12. The 3.3 volt and 5 volt supplies are typically used by digital circuits, while the 12 volt is used to run motors and disk drives and fans. Um, power supplies can also be single rail or dual rail or multi rail. Um, a rail is the printed circuit board or the PCB inside the power supply to which the external cables are connected. And we don't open the power supplies, so we're not actually going to see that. Um, a computer can tolerate slight fluctuations in power, but a significant deviation can cause the power supply to fail. Motherboard components. Um, the major components on a motherboard include the CPU, which is considered to be the brain of the computer or the nerve, nerve, nervous, central nervous system of the computer. Um, you have your RAM, which is temporary memory, stands for random access memory. You also have the um, chipset. Um, the chipset is your north bridge and your south bridge. 
Um, you have the basic input output system or BIOS chip. Um, it can be BIOS or UEFI, um, which stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. You have your SATA connectors. And again, SATA data is seven pins and SATA power is 15 pins. And then you have your internal USB connectors as well. Um, when we talk about the motherboard chipset, the chipset consists of integrated circuits on the motherboard that control how the CPU system hardware interacts with the CPU motherboard. Um, the chipsets consist of a north bridge. And I guess the way that I try to remember my north bridge and my south bridge, this image is good because it kind of gives you a visual. So your north bridge controls the important things on your computer. So obviously, um, it controls the speed of the RAM, your memory, and also access to video. So it's in, you know, the central location of usually your graphics adapter, your CPU and your, mem CPU and your memory, which are the, I would call them the important things on your PC. The South Bridge then allows communication to occur with things that are maybe considered to be less important. So like your hard drive, um, your keyboard and mouse, anything that's USB, um, your adapter cards that you might add to your PC. So that's kind of an that's kind of an easy way to remember. Maybe not easy, but it's one way to remember, you know, okay, what does the North Bridge do? What does the South Bridge do? And it's important to remember if we go back here and look at this image that the chipset might be an all-in-one. So your North Bridge, South Bridge might be interacting as an all-in-one device here. Um, but still in terms of its location, you know, it's right next to the RAM, it's kitty corner from the memory. And then right here would be your video slot. So it's really close to those things. And then those things that are less important, it's still secondary to your expansion slots and like your USB ports. Uh, motherboard form factors. So we talked about form factors in terms of power supply. Um, it pertains to the size and the shape of the board. So again, there are three common motherboard form factors. There's ATX, micro ATX, and there's ITX. Um, the um, ATX, like I said, is most pow is the most popular. Um, a micro is just a smaller footprint. So it's just not as big. It's not going to have as much um, expandability in terms of expansion cards inside. Um, but you have to make sure, I mean, usually when you go to buy a motherboard, the power supply comes along with it so that you make sure that they match because you can't put an AT power supply, which you probably can't even get anymore, um, on an ATX motherboard because for one, the connectors won't work. Two, even if they did, it wouldn't supply enough power for it. So the choice of motherboard form factor determines how individual components attach to it, the type of power supply required, and the shape of the computer case. Pretty much guaranteed they'll ask you form factor question on your test. Um, what is the CPU? CPU stands for Central Processing Unit and it's responsible for interpreting and executing commands. Um, the CPU is a small microchip that resides within the CPU package. The CPU socket is the connection between the motherboard and the processor itself. Um, and the CPU is what executes a program. So the program is the sequence of stored instructions. Each model of processor has an instruction set, which it executes. Um, the CPU executes the program by processing each piece of data as directed by the program and the instruction set. So while the CPU is executing one step of the program, the remaining instructors, instructions can be stored in what's called cache. And so um, there are two main instruction sets. There's RISC, R-I-S-C, which is Reduced Instruction Set Computer. And so what that is, is it's a small set of instructions designed to execute very rapidly. So I always remember RISC as rapid execution. And then you have the second one called Complex Instruction Set Computer, or CISC. And this architecture uses a broad set of instructions, which results in fewer steps. So 
risk is the rapid execution of a small set of instructions. CISC is a broad set of instructions, but fewer steps to complete the operation. Um, CPU sockets and processors have two different architectures. So as we look at um, the top one with the red arrow, you can see the little pins that are sticking up. That's called pin grid array or PGA. And the pins are on the underside of the processing and then they are inserted into the socket on the board. If we look at the bottom one, that's called LGA or land grid away, array. You see it's just flat um, little um, metal squares on that chip. The pins are actually in the motherboard and so you just match that up by laying it properly on that socket. Now the benefit of the pin grid array is if you bend a pin on a CPU all you have to do is buy a new CPU chip. If you bend a pin on the board of a LGA, now your whole motherboard is rendered not usable because you can no longer get that chip to function. So most motherboards that you see are pin grid array. Um, some of the um, CPUs will incorporate hyper threading, um, being able to work with multiple um, functions at once, um, hypertransport that enhances the performance of the CPU, um, the amount of data that a CPU can process at one time depends on the size of the processor data bus. A data bus are the little like gold traces that you see on the back of a motherboard. Um, they transfer the data uh, between um, different components. The speed of the CPU is rated in cycles per second. Um, so they can either be megahertz or gigahertz. Notice capital MH, small z, or capital GH, small z. Um, this is also called the CPU bus or the front side bus or FSB. And so um, the wider the processor data bus, the more powerful the processor is. So currently our processors are either 32-bit or 64-bit for the data bus. Overclocking is a technique used to make a process work faster than what it's originally specified to do. Um, it's really not a reliable way to improve the performance of your computer because it can actually damage your CPU. Um, the central processing unit the latest processor technology has resulted in CPU manufacturers finding ways to incorporate more than one CPU core onto a single chip. So you've got dual core CPU, which means it has two cores. Triple core has three, quad has four, hexa core has six, and octa core has eight cores inside of a single P or CPU. Um, It's interesting as you talk about the, the different, you know, a single core CPU handles all of the processing capability. Um, a dual core is two cores inside of a single CPU chip and they process information at the same time. You get to a triple core CPU and you have three cores inside of a single PC CPU, but it's actually a quad core processor with one of the cores being disabled. <laughs> and then a quad core is four cores. They can all work simultaneously. Um, that's going to give you enhancement when you're working with software applications. Um, and then, like I said, your hexa and your octa are six and eight cores inside of your CPU. Cooling systems, um, computer components perform better, obviously, when they're kept cool. And they use one of two solutions, either an active or a passive cooling solution. An active solution just requires power, while passive solutions do not. So passive solutions for cooling um, usually involve reducing the speed um, that the component is operating at. And then, or you could add heat sinks to the computer chips. Um, you have to remember that you need to try to keep the inside of a computer case cool 
if you have too much heat built up, you're going to end up damaging components. And so you need to increase that airflow. Um, again, a CPU fan is something that you could use um, to be able to add. Um, most CPUs today come with a fan already attached because they generate so much heat because they process so fast. Um, you can also have case fans. Um, the case fans can help dissipate that heat um, outside of the case or pull it outside of the case. Um, video adapter cards you will also see now coming with their own CPU fans attached to them because they produce such a great deal of heat, especially when you're working with gaming computers. Um, some computers with extremely fast CPUs and GPUs might use a water cooling system. It's just a metal plate paste, placed over the processor and water is pumped over the top, which then collects that heat um, and it generates it outside of the system. So the, the water is pumped to what is called you know, a radiator to be cooled and then recirculated back into the system. Types of memory. Um, I just want to point out at this point that I'm pretty sure that you are going to be tested on the different types of memory. So the next few slides that we talk about with memory are going to be important. Um, remember that Cisco, you know, there's a lot of information in a chapter and you're going to see that at the end of this PowerPoint when we look at the slides for the new terminology. And they're only going to give you, I mean, I haven't gone in and, and been able to look at the test yet, um, but generally they give you anywhere from 18 to 24, 26 questions. Think about all of the information that you're taking in. Um, so it's really not a lot of questions that they're testing you on, but they feel that memory is very important. So a computer uses different types of memory chips. All memory chips store data in the form of a byte. And so what a byte is, is a block of eight bits, and they're either ones or zeros on a chip. So data is read by a PC through a series of ones and zeros. You can think of it as a switch being turned on or off. And we're going to talk more about bits and bytes as we start talking about networking. Um, Read-only memory, or ROM, is um, usually located on your motherboard. Um, it's directly accessed by the CPU. Um, it's basic instructions for boot booting your PC and loading the operating system. ROM chips retain their contents even when the computer is powered down. So if you're booting up your computer and you remove the power from it, anything that's stored on that ROM chip is still there. It's considered to be non-volatile memory. Um, random access memory, or RAM, is just that temporary storage for data. So if you have an Excel program open, if you have your Outlook open, if you have a SCADA program open, um, if you have, I don't know, the internet open, you have all of those programs open. Only one of those programs can be active at a time. Everything else is being temporarily stored in RAM. RAM is volatile. You cut the power, it's going to go away. And so we always tell students, we try to do the comparison of saving something. You open up Microsoft Word. You are typing and all of a sudden the power goes out. You know, Microsoft's gotten pretty good at being able to retrieve that data, but that doesn't work with all applications. You cut the power and you lose whatever you might have been working on while that program was minimized and another one was being utilized. Um, so... Think of random access memory as kind of like a filing cabinet where things are temporarily stored until you save it and put it away in storage. Um, students will say, well, how come they don't just store everything in ROM? Why do they even worry about it? Well, ROM, if it's permanently stored there, the more things that are stored in ROM, the longer it's going to take your system to start up. And so that's why you don't store things in ROM. It's just that basic instruction set to allow your computer to be able to start up. Um, sometimes they call ROM firmware, which is misleading because firmware is software that's stored in ROM. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Adding more RAM in a computer enhances the system's performance, but the amount of RAM that can be installed is limited by your motherboard. So 
<clears throat> if you install too much memory on your motherboard, you'll get a black screen because it your boards can only handle so much memory. So you always want to make sure that you look at your um, system manual to know how much RAM it can hold. Because increasing that, you know, it's not going to hurt your board, but you're not going to see anything because you're exceeding the amount of RAM that it can store. Types of ROM. Guaranteed. You'll have a question on this. Guaranteed. Um, so I would try to memorize ROM and what the types of ROM and what they do. So you have ROM, which is read-only memory. Information is written to that. Um, it can't be erased or rewritten. And it's now obsolete. Um, we usually talk about ROM as being just a generic term for read-only memory that we use to boot our computer. PROM is programmable read-only memory. Information is written after it is manufactured. PROMs are generally bland and they can be programmed by a PROM programmer um, when needed. Generally, they can't be erased and can only be programmed once. EEPROM is erasable programmable read-only memory. It's non-volatile but can be erased by exposing it to strong ultraviolet light. Um, EEPROMs usually have a transparent quartz window, which you can kind of see up here in the third diagram um, on top of the chip. Constant erasing and reprogramming could render it useless, so it's not something that's done very often. And then you have EEPROM, which is electrical, electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. Information is written to the chip after it is manufactured and without um, removing it from the device. And EEPROM chips are also called flash ROMs since its contents can be flashed for deletion. Um, EEPROMs are often used to store a computer system's BIOS. Moving right along, the different types of RAM. Um, I put this chart together for you to be able to look at um, that deal with the different types of RAM. Um, dynamic RAM or DRAM is older technology, typically used for main memory. Um, it gradually discharges energy so it has to constantly be refreshed with pulses of electricity in order to maintain the stored data in the chip. Static RAM or SRAM requires constant power to function. It uses lower power consumption and so typically it's, it's the type that's utilized um, with PCs. And people say, well, that's like really backwards because static, you know, um, just requires constant power to function, but dynamic RAM has to constantly be refreshed. And so that's why static RAM is usually the RAM of choice. Um, you have SD RAM, synchronous dynamic RAM. Um, it's able to process overlapping instructions. Um, so that means it can process a read before a write has been even completed, has very high transfer rates. Um, then you get into DDR SD RAM, can do it twice as fast. You have DDR SD or DDR2 SD RAM. Um, again, can do it twice as fast, um, runs at a higher clock speed. DDR3 expands that bandwidth, has a connector of 240 pins, generates less heat. DDR4 SD RAM quadruples the DDR3 maximum storage capacity. Again, consumes less power, um, has 288 pins, and then GDDR synchronous dynamic RAM is designed for use with video graphics. Memory modules. Uh, memory chips are soldered to a circuit board to create a memory module which is placed into a memory slot on the motherboard. Um, your different types of memory modules, DIP, SIM, DIM, and SODIM. And so, um, as we talk about those DIPs, is a dual inline memory module or dual inline package, excuse me. It's just an individual memory chip. And you can see that um, in the first square in the diagram. Um, the DIM, the dual inline memory module, is a circuit board um, that can hold your SD RAM, your DDR SD RAM, or your DDR2 SD RAM chips. Um, you have your SODIMs, which you would find 
in a laptop because SODIM stands for small outline dual inline memory module. Um, SIM, single inline memory module, the second diagram in your image is old technology. You used to have to have SIM chips in pairs in order to get them to function on your board. Um, and if anybody's interested, I still have a board in which you could look at that. Um, the speed of the memory has a direct impact on how much data a processor can process in a given period of time. And the fastest memory is typically static RAM, which is used as cache memory, as I said. Um, the speed of the memory has a direct impact on how much data can be given at a period of time. The fastest memory, again, is typically SRAM because it's used as cache memory. You have three types of cache memory. You have L1 cache, which is integrated into the CPU. You have L2 cache, which was originally mounted on the motherboard, but now is integrated into the CPU. And you have L3 cache, which is used in some high-end workstations and some server CPUs. Um, memory errors occur when data is not stored correctly in the memory chips. The computer uses different methods to detect and correct errors in memory. So the different types of error checking include non-parity. Um, the memory does not check errors in memory. You have parity. The memory contains 8 bits of data for and 1 bit for error checking. And then you have ECC or error correction code. Um, the, it can detect multiple bit errors in memory and correct single bit errors in memory. So you're saying, okay, why do I need to know all of this about the L cache and the parity or non-parity. When you go to buy memory for a PC, you have to make sure that everything matches from the number of pins it has to whether it's parity, non-parity, ECC, to the L cache it uses, etc. You can't just go out and buy a generic memory module. Adapter cards are what we put into the PC, add to the motherboard to make it more functional. As I said, I showed you what ports are on a board so you can see what components are built into the board but anything else has to be added and typically the adapter cards that you add would be a sound card um, which you can see in the upper left corner of the diagram um, a NIC card or a network interface card we also called it a LAN so that you can hardwire in and have connectivity your wireless NIC in case you need some expandability with your wireless. Um, you might have a video adapter or a display adapter, which we saw in that ports image because it had a DVI and an HDMI connector. A capture card um, sends video signal to a PC so the signal can be recorded to a storage device with video capture software. Um, TV tuner cards ability to watch and record TV signals on a PC um, when you've got it connected via a cable. And then sometimes you have USB serial buses that just have multiple USB ports or um, eSATA cards will allow you to have um, additional internal or external SATA ports um, on your PC. Computers have expansion slots on the motherboard to install adapter cards. The type of adapter card must match the expansion slot. So we have PCIs, peripheral component interconnect. We have mini PCIs, which is just a smaller version. You have PCI X, which stands for PCI extended. You have PCI Express or a PCIe. And then you have riser cards and accelerated graphics ports. So a PCI is really like older technology now, 32-bits um, or 64-bit expansion. Your mini PCI can be a type 1, 2, or 3, depends on the form factor. PCI X is just an updated version of the PCI because, again, many have become obsolete. Um, your PCI Express is um, used because it's backward compatible with PCI slots. Um, PCI Express, you can either have um, one, four, eight, or 16 um, numbered slots. Um, you just have to make sure they match. So an example would be, if I had a, an old VGA port on a computer, but I had a PCI slot or a PCI X slot, I'm 
if my video goes bad on board from the VGA slot, then I'm going to add a video card to my motherboard with, you know, probably something like um, an HDMI port or a display port so that I can still have video. Um, a riser card can be added to a PC to provide additional expansion um, for your device. And then again, we talked about, you know, the AGP was designed strictly for videos and it's rarely used because of the PCI slots. Types of data storage. Um, we have hard drives, optical drives, solid state drives, and then the old tape drives. Um, magnetic disks are like your hard disk drive and your tape drive to be able to store the data. Solid state drives um, actually function more like a flash drive. They don't have any moving parts. Magnetic drives have moving parts, so when you drop one of those hard drives, you can knock the actuator out of sync and then that hard drive is no longer usable. It uses metal plates to record the data, whereas a solid state drive is just a board inside. If you've ever taken the outside cover off of a flash drive, that's what it looks like is just a board that you connect the power and data cables to. Then you also have the optical drives like your CD and DVD drives. Um, storage device interfaces, um, you're either going to have parallel or serial. And when we talk about serial, we're not talking about the old type of serial. We're talking about the new serial with SATA drives. So some of the boards that we work with may have some old parallel drives. They'll either be IDE or EIDE. Um, and you can see the transfer speed is either 8.3 megabits per second or 16.6 .6 megabits per second, so kind of slow, versus serial. Um, serial 1, 2, and 3, 1.5 gig, 3.0 gig, or 6.0 gig. Um, and so those are the three main types of SATA um, versions that you might see. Um, the cables and connectors are the same, but the data transfer speeds would be different. Magnetic storage, um, as I said, uses platters to store the data, um, ranges from gigabytes to terabytes. Um, tape drives are used for archiving data, so a lot of times you back things up to tape drives um, in case your network would go down, you could get up and running again very quickly because you have got things stored on removable tape cartridges, and they can store from gigabytes to terabytes of data. Semiconductor storage, or um, when we're talking about solid state drives, um, they store data as electrical charges in semiconductor flash memory, so they're much faster than magnetic hard drives. Um, again, as I said, solid state drives have no moving parts, they don't make any noise, they're more energy efficient, and produce less heat than hard drives. My guess is that the laptops that we have, and I haven't looked up the specs yet, but because they are so light and so small, have solid state drives in them and not magnetic hard drives. When I first started teaching this class, everyone was so excited because solid state drives were coming out. But at that time, solid state drives were $1,200 a piece. I'll never forget the price of the solid state drive. And so everybody was excited waiting until they became less and less expensive so that they could be able to afford them. And now solid state drives are typically what you see. You, you very rarely see um, magnetic hard drives being put into systems anymore unless they're older systems. Um, the solid state drives come in three form factors. You have the disk drive form factor, which is similar to a hard drive, a magnetic hard drive. Um, you have expansion cards, which plug right into the motherboard, and they mount in the computer like an expansion card does. Um, and so that would be an example of the bottom left, bottom right corner. And then you also have MSATA or M2 modules. Um, that you can see on the left side of that image. These packages use a special socket called an M.2, um, and it's a standard for computer expansion cards. Um, the Non-Volatile Memory Express, or NVMe, specification was developed specifically to allow computers to take greater advantage of the features of SSDs by providing a standard interface between SSDs and the PCIe bus and operating system. NVMe allows compliant solid state drives to attach to the PCIe bus 
without requiring special drivers. You also have solid state hybrid drives, which are just kind of a compromise between a magnetic hard drive and a solid state drive. They're faster than a, a magnetic hard drive, but they're less expensive than a solid state hard drive. So they combine a magnetic hard drive with onboard flash, which serves as non-volatile cache. Types of optical storage. Um, optical drives just use lasers to read and write data to the optical media. And so they were developed because they wanted to get rid of the limitations of old floppy disks, <laughs> which would only store 1.44 meg of data um, compared to your CDs, which would start out storing like 700 meg of data. And now, you know, up to DVDs that can store, you know, 8.5 if they're dual layer, um, or you have Blu-ray discs, which really didn't catch on a whole lot, but they could store um, up to 50 gig on a dual layer. So those are the three types of optical drives. You have CD, which is audio and data. You have DVDs, which is digital video and data. And then you have Blu-ray discs, which are um, HD digital video and data. And so the chart that they showed you in the curriculum is this one that I have in the um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, they tell you what it can read, what it can record, what it can write to, and so you guys can go through and read those on your own. Video ports and cables. Um, a video port connects a monitor to a computer using a cable. Um, video ports and monitor cables transfer analog signals, digital signals, or both. And so um, you have the different cables. You have the DVI, the digital visual interface. Um, you know, and they, they tell you that you should like kind of memorize the pins and the patterns. Um, it's typically white, has up to 24 pins. So it would be three rows of eight pins. If you actually look at that image and count them, you should be able to see that um, used for digital signals. So four pins are for analog. And then you also have that ground bar that you can see off to the left on that image. Um, you have your display port, which connects high-end graphics cables and PCs and home theater equipment. So just about everything now comes with display ports. HDMI used for high-definition TVs, but also works for PCs because of the digital features. Um, the Thunderbolt 1 or 2 is a high-speed high connection for peripherals. Um, hard drives, RAID arrays, network interfaces can also transmit, transmit high-def video using the DisplayPort protocol. Um, the Thunderbolt 3, which is the second diagram on that bottom image, um, same connector as a USB-C, but it has twice the bandwidth of the Thunderbolt 2, uses less power, and can provide two 4K monitors with video. Um, you have the VGA, or the Video Graphics Array. It's analog video, three rows, 15 pins. And then you have the RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, um, found in groups of three, the yellow connector connects or carries video, the red and white carry the left and right audio. Um, input output ports on a computer connect peripheral devices such as printer scanners and portable drives. So a computer can have other ports. So we can have a network port, which we called um, a LAN port or an RJ45 port. Um, it can have a PS2 or a personal system 2, not to be confused with the gaming system, the old gaming system. You can have a serial ATA. Um, again, this red cable in the image on the left is your serial data, has seven pins. The one with the multicolored cables to the left of that um, is a 15 pin power cable. In that center image on the bottom there, you can see the um, IDE cables, um, usually used for hard drives and optical drives. Um, and then you can also see in that far right picture on the bottom image, you see a USB port or connector. Um, and we talked about the audio game ports, which are in the top image right in the middle. There are many um, connection standards used today, um, and these components are called adapters or converters. A converter performs the same function as an adapter, but also translates the signals from one technology to another. And an adapter 
just connects one technology to another. So when we talk about devices, you have a male end and a female end of the cable. The male end has the pins and the female end just has the um, sockets. And so you might need to do, it's called, it's honestly called in the technology world a gender changer, where you put that adapter on one end so that you can change out the connection type to meet um, the device that you're connecting to. So we have DVI to VGAs, we have USBs to Ethernets, we have USBs to PS2s, we have DVIs to HDMIs, we have Molex to SATA, and we have HDMI to VGA. Um, the original input devices, um, input devices all use all input devices allow, sorry, input devices allow the user to communicate with the computer. Um, some of the first input devices included the keyboard and mouse, um, a flatbed scanner, uh, joystick game pads, and then you also have your KVM switch, which is just simply a hardware device that can be used to control more than one computer using a single keyboard monitor and mouse, which is what we do today if you go into anybody's office on campus. They usually have dual monitors, but they're running everything with a single keyboard and mouse, but they might have dual display monitors. Um, some of the newer input devices, touch screens, styluses because it digitizes, the magnetic strip reader to encode the, the data on the back of your cards, which people have been using a lot during COVID, and then your barcode scanners um, that can scan the information in. Um, digital cameras, webcams are also considered input devices, signature pads where you sign your name, um, smart card readers, and then your microphone is also considered to be an input device. Um, NFC devices and terminals stands for near field communication. That's where you can just tap to pay. Um, those are kind of nice, like to get into the building. All I have to do is tap my ID card to get in. When you go to print at our printers here at school, you just tap your ID card to print. Um, facial recognition scanners, fingerprint scanners, big on phones. Anytime you want to get to a website, you can choose to use your fingerprint scan voice recognition scanners, and then virtual reality headsets. So lots of different types of input devices. Um, an input device is simply how you're going to get information to something. Then we go to output devices. So all of the code needs to be converted into binary so that you see the output. So examples of output would be your monitors, your projectors, the VR headsets, printers, speakers, headphones. Think about all of those as being output, how you hear, see, receive information. Um, monitors and projectors. Most monitors use one of three types of technology, either LCD, LED, or OLED. Um, LED um, is an LCD display that uses LED backlighting to display the data. Um, OLED is an organic it stands for organic LED, uses a layer of organic material that responds to electrical stimulus to emit light. Um, each pixel, pixel lights individually giving a deeper black level compared to LED. Um, LCD is two polarizing filters with a liquid crystal solution between them. Um, the electronic current aligns the crystals so that the light can either pass through or not pass through. And the effect of the light passing through in certain areas and not in others is what creates the image that you see on your screen. Most video projectors use either LCD or DLP technology. Um, DLP stands for digital light processing. Um, DLP projectors use a spinning color wheel with a microprocessor controlled array of mirrors called a digital micro mirror device or a DMD. Different projectors have different numbers of lumens, which affects the level of brightness of the projected image. VR and AR headsets. So virtual reality uses computer technology to create a simulated three-dimensional environment. A VR headset completely encases the upper portion of users' faces, not allowing any ambient light from their surroundings. 
then you have augmented reality. Use a similar technology but superimposes images and audio over the real world in real time. AR can provide users with immediate access to information about their real surroundings. An AR headset usually does not close off ambient light to users, allowing them to see their real life surroundings. Printers are output devices. They create hard copies of files. So that hard copy could be on a sheet of paper. It could be also, uh, it could also be a 3D image from a, um, a 3D printer. There are different types of laser printer or different types of printers. You have inkjet, impact, thermal, laser, and 3D printers. So an inkjet just sprays the ink onto the page. Um, and it can do that um, either by spraying it or using piezoelectric, um, which uses little crystals. You have impact printers, which are the old printers that strike the paper and run on a wheel. Um, you have thermal, which would be um, the printers that, like, if you go to a store and they print off a receipt, that's a thermal printer. They're sensitive to air. Um, you have to make sure that, because, like, if you fold that up and put it in your wallet and take it out later, it might all be black. That's a good indication that it was thermal. Um, Laser printers um, use the corona wire to print using the high heat that melts it onto the page. Um, and then you have the 3D printers. Printers can either be wired or wireless. All printers require some sort of printing material such as ink, toner, liquid, plastic, etc. And then printers use a driver to communicate with the operating system. Speakers and headphones are also output devices. Um, speakers are a type of auditory output device. Most computers um, and mobile devices have audio support either integrated into the motherboard or on an adapter card. Headphones, earbuds, and the earphones found in headsets are all auditory output devices, and they can either be wired or wireless. Um, some are Wi-Fi or Bluetooth enabled. So that brings us to the end of the material in Chapter 1. Um, I just want to reiterate the three main objectives, explaining how to keep a personal computer and components safe, explain the features and functions of the components, and then we will work in lab on how to disassemble a computer. The last three slides I have in here for you, oh, I don't have them in here, oh, I don't have them in here for you. <laughs> um, I will probably have to go back and, um, activate those because for some reason they're deactivated um, with the terms and commands but I'll provide that to you um, also here are the three slides that have um, the different terms on them that you used so I just wanted to make sure to point those out to you Actually, I think they are in the slideshow um, in the MyTech site, but I will go upload this one in there as well so that you have the PowerPoint that I used for this video.